Good morning. Welcome to Ashton Valley Calvary Chapel and our, our first service today, the 9 o'clock. We're glad you guys are here this morning to uh, seek the Lord together, to worship, to spend time in his word, and to uh, pray together and just to uh, have fellowship, just to connect with God and with each other. So we're glad you're here for our first service today. By the way, if you're a guest, we consider it an honor to have you with us. And if you'd like somebody from the leadership team to connect with you on the offering box back there, there are welcome cards. Fill one of those out and request somebody to connect with you. If you have prayer requests, we have a lot of different ministries involved in prayer in our fellowship. So if you'd like prayer about something specifically, you can fill that in as well. Or just put that in there separately. And it'll get to our prayer team so that we can uh, just be praying for you and for the needs that exist. So again, we're glad you guys are here this morning on this beautiful fall day. Hard to believe it's this time of the year. What a week from Thursday. It's Thanksgiving. Isn't that incredible? And man, the time is just flying. So uh, let's enjoy uh, the time as we have it today, this morning, just to worship. And uh, again, we're so glad you guys are here this morning to join us. So Chris is going to pray for us as we open. So just join our hearts together and let's seek the Lord. Lord God, we humbly come before your throne of grace. And Lord, we, we are so thankful that you tore the veil and you allow us to come directly into your presence, Lord. So God, this morning as we come together as your church, I pray that you would just help us to put aside all of our cares of the world, God, um, and just be able to focus on you and take advantage of this sanctuary, this place of your worship that we can turn our hearts and our minds towards you, God, that we can spend these next few minutes, few hours, God, just in your presence through your worship, through your word, through prayer. So God, we give this time to you. Help us to not just say the words of these songs, but to lift them as our worship to you, God. To get inside our bubble that we're not distracted by the people around us, we're not distracted by our own thoughts, but our hearts and minds are just focused on you and who you are and worshiping you because you're worthy, regardless of our situations here on earth, God. God, we thank you that you allow us in your throne room. And God, we just enter in, in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can stand if you like or remain seated. Always the attitude of our hearts as we worship is what matters most, that we would worship in spirit and in truth. And, uh, you know, all creation cries out the reality of a creator. And so this morning uh, we're going to join and all the earth will sing his praises. Let's worship. Jesus, you took, you take our sins. You took, you take our sins away, oh God. You give, you gave your life away for us. You came down, you saved us. 
saved us through the cross. Our hearts are changed because of your great love. Sing it, church. You lived, you died, you said in three days you would rise. You did. You're you up this morning, God. You lived, you died, you said in three days you would rise. You lived, you died, you said in three days you would rise. You lived, you died, you said in You're alive. You rule. You reign. You said you're coming back again. I know you will. And all the earth will sing your praises. And all the earth will sing. Lord, we sing your praise, and we give you the glory and honor that you alone deserve, God. Overwhelm us with your presence, with your love and your kindness as we lift you up this morning, Lord. Oh, 
to you hold in worship this morning. More like Chris prayed this morning. God, that we're so caught up in your presence and our love for you that we're totally unaware of even the people around us. God, that we just love you, that we just praise you. That we have freedom to worship you and to seek you and how we need this time is to glorify you and honor you as you inhabit the praises of your people. God, thank you that there is power in your mighty name. The name above all names, the name of Jesus. And we just continue to worship and seek you, God.
The word has come to silence every doubt. He is here. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power, power in His name. There is power in the name of Jesus. declaration, Jesus, that you are Lord, you are God, and we can never thank you enough, we can never praise you enough, God, what a gift it is to join our hearts this morning in your presence, thank you for this appointment that we have with you, the King, Lord, forgive us when we neglect our time with you, personally, and prayer, and worship, and everything else, Lord, just again, refresh and give us a, a new appreciation and understanding of what it is, God, the gift you've been given. Spend time with you, God. Thank you so much, Lord. And Father, as we come, as we continue in your presence, Lord, we turn our hearts to a time of prayer as Rob leads in this devotional. In the prayer time, God, just give him sensitivity to your word. And again, we always pray we would pray your will, nothing more, nothing less. So may that be the case this morning as he prays, as we join our hearts with him, and, and even where we're seated, Lord, if there's things you're placing on our hearts to pray on, Lord, we just look to you. Just continue to be with us as we continue before you with worshipful attitudes, our focus on you. In Jesus' name. You guys can be seated for our devotion and prayer. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Many years ago, a paramedic showed me a soldier's knapsack Bible. 
It had belonged to his uncle who had been killed in World War I. The Bible, along with his other possessions, had been returned to his family after his death. As they looked through the Bible, they discovered these words from Romans were underlined in pencil. For thy sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. They seemed to describe the young man's horrifying experiences fighting trench warfare in the front in France. Alec, the paramedic, felt as though his young uncle was speaking beyond the grave, letting him know that his death at the Somme was a sacrifice for the freedom of the people back home. But the message didn't end there. Verses 38 and 39 were double underlined, revealing the young soldier's faith, which death could not diminish nor destroy. Romans 8, 38 and 39 says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He knew he was fighting for freedom, but he also knew that no matter what happened to him there during that time of war, his safety and security were found in Jesus. Is our faith that strong that even in the midst of the greatest struggles and the greatest challenges that we can face, and those struggles and challenges are different for every person as to how their intensity feels, but in the midst of those struggles, do we have the strength of faith to understand that nothing that challenges us in this world can ever snatch us from the hands of God? Our military face those struggles on a daily basis. And a lot of people joke about how in foxholes there are no atheists. I know that's not true, but I know that in the midst of those struggles that they face, a lot of them turn to God. A lot of them realize that they need someone, something greater, bigger, and stronger than they are to get them through what they're going through. Hopefully is... I'm hoping and praying that most of us in here are believers that whenever we face those kinds of intense struggles, those intense challenges daily, that we remember to run to Jesus and not from him, that we remember that he is in our corner. He has promised us he will never leave nor forsake us. Yesterday we celebrated Veterans Day, and I just want us to to remember that there are men out there, men and women both, who are facing struggles. They are facing trials. They are facing tribulations, for some of them greater than anything they've ever faced. And I pray that it isn't just on one or two days out of the year that we remember to lift them up in prayer. I've been there. I know what it's like to to be in situations and, and where you just feel utterly hopeless sometimes. And, and I didn't have the benefit of having God on my side when I was a, a Marine. I was actively running from him, so I can attest to the fact that there are atheists in foxholes. But after I did find him, I know what a joy, what a blessing it was. And I knew that I did have a grandmother who was basically the only real Christian in my family at the time who was actively praying for me. And even though I didn't really believe in God, I kind of had a sense of peace knowing that someone did care enough to be lifting me up in prayer. So the point of all of that is just be lifting up our men and women daily. Let them know that there is someone who cares for them enough to take time out of their day to, to say a prayer for them. They greatly appreciate it. Let's pray. Father, we just come to you, Lord, and we do lift up the men and women of our military. On a day like Veterans Day, Memorial Day, it is a a special time where we are prompted nationally to, to remember to lift up the men and women who serve this great country, this country that has given us so many freedoms, so many blessings because of their pursuit of you. 
and the freedoms that we have are because there are men and women who willingly volunteer to go fight our nation's enemies on foreign shores in the, the hopes and the prayers that we won't have to fight them here. So far, we have been blessed to have mostly a strife-free existence as a nation because of these men and these women. So we just want to take time now to lift them up to you, wherever they're at, anywhere in this world, Lord, that you would just be with them, be the God of peace for them, be the God of protection for them, and help to remind us who are safe back here in this great nation to take time out of our day daily to lift them up, to lift their safety up to you. And not just the men and women who are overseas fighting, Lord, but their families who are back here without them. The sacrifices that they make are just as great and sometimes greater. Fighting the battle back at home. Trying to to make ends meet, to pay the bills, to take care of the family. So, Lord, be with them as well. Father, we want to lift up this service to you today. Lord, that you would be with Phil as he is about to get into the time of the word. Lord, let his words be your words, Lord, and let those words find receptive hearts in in the seats today, Lord. As, As we study your word, Lord, help us to not just hear the words that are being said, but, Lord, to apply them to our lives, to be molded and shaped into the people that you call us to be as your children. Father, we want to take time to lift up the men and women of our law enforcement and all the first responders that that fight the battle back here at home, Lord. And it seems like daily that battle grows more and more great and more and more intense. Keep them safe, Lord. Keep them protected. And we thank you for men that choose, men and women both who choose to to, to pursue those jobs. And, and sometimes they are very thankless jobs. But if it weren't for them, Lord, then our our freedoms would not be anywhere near as great here either. So we thank you for them and for the challenges that they face, Lord, and just keep them safe, keep them protected, and let them know we care, Lord. We have such a great country, such an amazing country, Lord. Even in the midst of the, the struggles and the trials that we are facing as a nation here today, Lord, is still far greater and we have far more freedoms than most nations around this world enjoy and we know that it's because of you lord that you have blessed this nation as greatly as you have and we just want to thank you for that lord in jesus name amen i want to take a minute before uh, we turn it over to phil to recognize men and women that have served our nation if is there any veterans here today Anybody that served? If you serve, please stand. Please stand, yeah. Andy, I know that you're, you're about a, he, to. He's enlisted. He's waiting orders to, uh, to go forward in the Air Force. So you're enlisted. Please stand. We want to honor you for your willingness to serve. Everybody join me in just thanking them. <laughs> and there's one more thing, Rodney and Bob. Phil. Oh, hey, while you guys are coming up, I do want to point out, because I know if you have family that's actively serving too, uh, and they're represented, I know Matt and Tanya, their daughter, uh, Taylor, is serving in Hawaii, her husband as well. They're both in the Marines, they're active duty over there right now, so just continue to pray for everyone who thoughtfully serves. So, Last month was Pastor's Appreciation, and we announced it, and you folks willingly gave, and So we have this gift that we want to give you and your beautiful wife, Chris, to thank you for the service you do for us here at this church. So thank you, sir. That means so much. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you guys very much. Group hug right here. There we go. Hug it out. (laughs) Um, Yeah, thank you very much, guys. Very, very thoughtful. Uh, you know, we, we said last month, 
again, what a privilege it is to just to be a part of this church family, to serve here. And it's 18 years now that we've been a, a fellowship family, and it's just a, a wonderful, wonderful privilege. Um, we know that you pray for us. That's really, really important. We pre- appreciate your encouragement and support and uh, your thoughtfulness in a tangible way with uh, giving us a gift. The, the way things are structured, and it's, and it's just fine, but, you know, like in some jobs, people get bonuses and stuff like that, and, and really, I don't, and that's okay. That's by design, but you know what? When you guys and your thoughtfulness during pastor appreciation bless us financially, it really helps with, uh, with bills and things like that, so I just want to let you guys know what a blessing it is to us when you guys I just very thoughtfully have, have supported us. So it means very, very much. So I just want to thank you guys. Solo clap for all of you guys. And hey, by the way, before we go into announcements, something that's on my heart, that I just want to thank all of you who come to the first service because the second service is packed out. And we're in a place, uh, you know, we used to have, this is the second year, actually we're going, I think in, in the first of the year, it'll be two years that we've been doing two services. And... Um, you know, we were running 70 to 100 in our first service, second service packed out, and there's ebb and flow and stuff, and we're still in a place that we have to have two services, and I know it's, uh, it's different. I mean, you've got two different services. It's, it's a different feel in the second service where it's jam-packed wall-to-wall, and I appreciate you guys' thoughtfulness because we have all the families, we've got all the little kids, and we're just not in a place where we could have one service, and so thank you. Thank you guys so much for your thoughtfulness in coming to this service. Continue to pray because someday we're going to be in that new building in God's timing. And we're going to have seating for 430. We'll be back to one service where we're all together. And uh, we're looking forward to that. So, uh, by the way, just continue to be in prayer. When Chris and I were at uh, the Calvary Chapel Senior Pastors and Wives Conference in Anaheim this last week, and we missed you guys. Appreciate Bob and his wonderful teaching on Messianic Miracles. It was truly a blessing. There were about 2,000 uh, senior pastors and wives from Calvary Chapels from around the world. And just to have that time together was wonderful. And there, there happened to be a workshop relating to building projects for Calvary Chapels. And it was prayer, faith, and phases. And that was truly a blessing. And uh, there's some movement. There's some stuff happening behind the scenes on our building project. You know, there are ebbs and flows. It's part of the deal. And you know what? God stretches our faith when there seems to be an activity. It's easy, right, when things are proactive and going, but that's when God stretches our faith. But there are things happening, and uh, we're looking forward to giving a a major presentation right after the first of the year. We're probably going to set aside a Saturday night with a ton of details about stuff that we could no way share on a Sunday morning, okay? So be looking forward to that, but also, as you guys are aware, a team of six of us are headed down to Calvary Chapel in St. George the first weekend in December. I'm going to be teaching that Sunday at Calvary in St. George, and that Saturday, this group and this team will be meeting with some of their leadership because of what they've gone through in their building project. They're going to come alongside of us and share some things about their journey we're also going to be meeting relating to missions, Mexico missions trips, and then also uh, relating to the Israel trip in 2019 because we're partnering with them for the Israel trip coming in 2019. As you know, uh, I went and led worship for their fellowship this last spring in Israel, and it's just an amazing adventure. And we do have some of you already who are, are saving and preparing for that trip in 2019. So you've got about a year and a half. It's going to be an amazing adventure. And next Sunday, we'll actually have the pamphlets and the information sheets for you guys related to the Israel trip. So we'll be praying about it, and it's a wonderful fellowship family. We're excited to go connect with them. And Pastor Rick may very well come up in January to be a part of that presentation on the building project to share his experience on what Calvary Chapel St. George went through as part of their project for encouragement and just to uh, give us some insights, right? So we're excited because things are moving. And by the way, the next phase for the building project is the plumbing. We found out that we need uh, $20,000 to do the rough in on the plumbing, and we're about halfway there already. We, may need, we need about $10,000, and then we can do the plumbing phase. And so that's really, really important, folks, because the way it works out is that we have to have something that needs inspected every six months to continue to keep our permitting uh, fluid. Otherwise, we have to re-go. So we've got about three months on our current situation. So we're just trusting the Lord, you know, and going into the end of the year. A lot of the times God stirs people's hearts. Even people who have tax write-offs and things like that may look at blessing a church and stuff. So again, we've always taught the example of the tabernacle and the Lord stirs the right hearts. And as you guys know, we don't do fundraising. 
and we don't put a lot of pressure on people. We just keep you guys up to speed, and we pray, right? And you know what? God gets the glory because everybody realizes the only way that could happen, the only way that's what's happened down there so far has to be God. It's not because man made it happen. It's because the Lord has directed it. So we're excited, and we'll just share some more of that stuff as it's uh, warranted. And I just want to give you guys a heads up on all that. Chris has uh, some announcements relating to ministry team stuff, right? And uh, it is that time of the year. Yes, you do. Are we on? Okay. Um, just something that I want to share that with the building workshop that we went to, one of the things that was a real encouragement to me, which isn't going to sound like an encouragement, <laughs> but they built their building the same way we are with basically, we had a lot of confirmation that everything we've been doing, they also did. And um, the encouraging thing was he said, it took 15 years to finish, to get into their building, which is well, not the, the so Well, the building exciting. project yeah, wasn't building. 15 years. They had been a church for, for 20 now, but it was 15 years into it when the Lord directed them into a building project. And they started so. their project. So I know we start getting weary and thinking that it's not happening very fast, but it is through prayer and faith and phases. And it's just phase by phase as God provides. So... So that, even though it sounds like a long time, it, it, I took encouragement to that because I get kind of impatient. So that was good for me to hear. <laughs> I know, shocking, <laughs> <Not> shocking. <Chris. laughs> okay, so my announcements. First is OCC. This week is our collection week. The building has to be open since we are a major collection site. Monday through Saturday, um, 9 to 6, correct? 9 to 5, sorry. So if we could have some volunteers, we've got a few people already who have stepped up. If you could just come and uh, be here for a couple of hours. Tanya's done it a lot in the past, but she went and got a job on us. So um, <laughs> Monday's the biggest day because it's Phil's day off, so he's not in the building. So anyway, if you have availability, just let me know after church, and I'll get us a schedule made up tonight and let everybody know. Um, also, we're going to have a packing party, our final packing party, Thursday um, at 7. We'll do it over here in the CKC side, and we'll have that last push there. And just to put it on your radar, as soon as this week's over, we will be kicking off our Helping Hands Christmas Eve dinner. So if you're not a part of that or haven't been here for that, what we do is on Christmas Eve, we provide dinner um, for all the shut-ins. That's the only night of the year that Meals on Wheels doesn't deliver meals. So that's how the ministry started as a replacement for that. And it's grown to just serve meals to anyone who's in need that night. So be ready for that. And last thing, we still have these papers back on the back table for volunteers. At the first of the year, hopefully we'll have all of our teams set up. And it's just the church body is made up of hands and feet and ears and noses and all of that. <laughs> and so everybody has a place to serve, to be a part of the body. So if there's anything, take one of these, pray about it, look over the different areas. If you have questions on any of them, contact me. But if there's an area that God just puts on your heart that you want to be involved in, just fill that out and leave it in the box back there and we'll get you plugged into a team that oversees that area of our church. So I yeah. think that's all. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, just quickly, relating to that, by the way, uh, we are a blessed fellowship. We have about 70 people who serve as volunteers. There's over 50 just in our children's and youth ministries alone, but you incorporate all the other ministries. That's pretty good. Thank the Lord. Usually in a lot of churches, it's 10% uh, doing the work, right? We're better than that in terms of having more people. So thank you. All those of you who made yourselves available to be Jesus' heart and hands and his feet to the body and just to serve, it's wonderful. So if you feel like the Lord is stirring your heart and you want to be involved, then fill one of those out. We'll connect with you as he just orchestrates because that's the reality. It's Jesus' church, right? He knows what he wants to do. He knows how he's uniquely gifted each of us to serve. And so we trust him to raise up the right people at the right time. And he's been faithful for 18 years to do just that. So thank you guys so much for your faithfulness. And on, on that note, folks, we have, we try to have monthly leadership koinonias. And what that is, is a time for people who serve. By the way, if you serve, 
you have influence. If you have influence, you're a leader. By virtue of that, you're part of the leadership team. You are invited, if you serve here, to come to our leadership koinonias. It's a time we come together to encourage each other. But the most important aspect is we join our hearts in prayer before the throne of our God and our King. And it's amazing. And we've really struggled this fall to get people together because of schedules and all those things. But, but please do not take lightly the importance of our koinonias. And uh, for some people, uh, you know, the most we've ever had for a koinonia with that many people who serve is like 30. Last time we had eight. That's the worst attendance we've had in a long time. But it, I think it's schedule related. But because of the schedules, we try to find a time that works for this month. And it turns out this Thursday is going to be the best time this month. So please, if you serve, come at 630. We're not going to have the meal this time. We're just going to have desserts. So if you can bring a dessert, that's great. We'll have dessert at 6.30, then we'll jump into prayer at 7 and really see God's face, and we'll see what December brings. And it'll be probably easier after the first of the year where we get through everything with the Christmas plays and all that stuff. That, by the way, that reminds me. There is a Christmas play. <laughs> December the 12th, Tuesday night, World Vision Assembly of God. Again, they're graciously allowing us to use their facility. So 6 o'clock, December the 12th, we have our fellowship dinner. Down there, we'll have sign-up sheets for items coming up here shortly, okay? So we're looking forward to that. And play practice starts today. There's a lot of kids who've signed up, a lot of people who volunteer to be a part of that. So right after the second service, Angie will be uh, leading that. and She's got a great team of people who are overseeing that. So be praying for them, excited to see what's going to happen. That's going to be a wonderful time of, of fellowship. So that's really literally a month away. It'll be a wonderful time to connect on that evening. So do we are we playing an OCC video? Not to, okay, because we've had one every Sunday, and again, you know the value of that ministry, and here we are in the final push. Again, by the way, if you want to, to serve here, I'm typically here throughout the week. And if, and if I'm out on visitation or something like that, I'll leave a note. But if you're a lady and you want to serve, please let us know, because I can't be here. We have a policy. I will not be in the building by myself with a woman. That's not going to happen. So if there's somebody here who wants to serve, just let us know so we can schedule the week out so that I know who's here, and if there's just a lady by herself, then you'll be here, and then I won't be, <laughs> okay? So let us know that is part of the deal. In this day and age, folks, that's the way it is, and that's the way it has to be. We live in a crazy world, and it's just too bad that uh, we have to have policy and stuff like that as well, amen? All right, let's get into the Word. Thank you guys so much for allowing us to go through so much detail, and uh, there is a lot to share. So we open our Bibles to 1 John chapter 5, folks. We're in the final chapter of this fantastic study. And we're going to do half of this chapter today, and next Sunday we're going to conclude our study in 1 John. We're in the home stretch now. And it's been a wonderful study. And uh, just kind of give you a preview, by the way, of the next few weeks, that the following Sunday after next Sunday, I'm going to do 2 John. It's one chapter. We're going to do that. When I'm gone the first weekend in December, and that team, and we're down in St. George, and I'll be teaching at the Calvary down there on that Sunday morning for their two services. Bob is going to finish up that series, the short series that he started last Sunday on Messianic Miracles. And folks, that's perfect. What a great introduction in December to the Christmas season, right? Because a lot of the things, obviously, about Christmas are Messiah coming. And those miracles pointed to the reality that Jesus is Messiah. And so uh, after that, that next Sunday, I'm going to do Third John. And then I'm really excited because the following Sunday, and it's perfect for Christmas season, I praise the Lord for His direction in all this, we're going to start a verse-by-verse -verse study in the Gospel of Matthew. And that's perfect for Christmas season. I am really fired up to get into that. It's going to be a wonderful journey, folks. All about Jesus. Amen? Amen. So here we go. We're going to jump in today then. In 1 John, join me as we read the first 12 verses I'm going to be reading and teaching out of the NLT today. We find this, as John was inspired by the Holy Spirit, it says that everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has become a child of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his children too. We know we love God's children if we love God and obey His commandments. Loving God means keeping His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. For every child of God defeats this evil world, and we achieve this victory through our faith. And who can win this battle against the world? Only those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And Jesus Christ was revealed as God's Son by His baptism in water and by His shedding of His blood on the cross, not by water only, but by water and blood. 
and the Spirit who is truth confirms it with His testimony. So we have these three witnesses, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and all three agree. Since we believe human testimony, surely we can believe the greater testimony that comes from God. And God has testified about His Son. All who believe in the Son of God know in their hearts that this testimony is true. Those who don't believe this are actually calling God a liar because they don't believe what God has testified about His Son. And this is what God has testified. He has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life, and whoever does not have God's Son does not have life. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, as we just begin this uh, time in Your Word today, Lord, it's a blessing. God, Your Word is living and active. It's powerful. Holy Spirit, just accomplish what you intend to in each of our hearts, and may we be willing participants, that we would embrace your word, Lord, that you would just give clarity and application, Lord, of the truths of your word. Jesus, we're here to glorify you and honor you and to grow in the grace and knowledge of who you are, to gain a greater knowledge of your word, and again, that the living word would apply to our lives. So just have your way today as we trust you, Holy Spirit, to lead us and direct us in this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know what? This is awesome stuff. And I just want to remind you guys, as we are concluding 1 John, a chronology of when God inspired the Scriptures through John, relating to 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, the Gospel of John, and the book of Revelation. Sometimes we come to the Bible, and I think because the books are this way, if it's not a chronological Bible, we still kind of think that that's a timeline, okay? And I think most people think that God inspired John to write the Gospel of John first. No, he didn't. God inspired John to write 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John first in about 93 A.D. 95 A.D., he sent to the island of Patmos. And there it's on the island of Patmos that he was inspired to write the book of Revelation, the Apocalypse, it's the revealing, the unveiling. And a year later, in about 96, 97 A.D., is when the Lord inspired him to pen the Gospel of John. And it really kind of crescendos because the Gospel of John is amazing. It's all about the deity of Christ. And so God had inspired John to pen these, and you can see the reality of what he emphasizes, things about a testimony, about understanding the reality. And in chapter 1, he talks about the fact that he and the other apostles had been eyewitnesses to Jesus Christ and his ministry and everything that he did from the point that he was raised from the waters and baptism and Jesus then called the disciples to follow him as Messiah till the time he was hanging on the cross and they witnessed him suffer and to die and then he was raised from the third on the third day right and then it was 40 days after his resurrection that Jesus would engage the disciples from time to time and continue to love them and invest in them and to encourage them and it was through all that that the Lord inspired John in his older ages to pen first second third John then the book of Revelation, and finally the Gospel of John. And at the heart of all of that is to testify and to lift up Jesus Christ as Messiah, that He is God in the flesh. And so he continues to reiterate key themes that we've seen throughout all of this particular letter. Look what he says in verse 1. He says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ, Messiah, Mashiach, has become a child of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his children too. Remember this theme of love is all throughout of this, right? And the importance of loving the Lord. And then if we love the Lord, then God will stir the Holy Spirit, will stir us to love those around us. So when he says everyone who believes, that is a theme that the Lord inspired John to touch on time and time again. Especially when you get to the Gospel of John. After the Lord had used him to pen these letters and then the book of Revelation, you see in that magnus opus, really, right, of the Gospel of John, time and time again he hits on belief, believe, believe, believe. And here's the reality. That word believe, pastuo, means to enter into a vital, active wholehearted, continuous trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It's not, oh, I, yeah, I believe in God. No, it's, Lord, I'm all in. I believe that you are God in the flesh. I place my trust in you as Messiah. I believe you died on the cross, and on the third day you were raised from the dead, and it's in you alone that I have eternal life. It's a wholehearted trust and faith and commitment to Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what that means here. He says, everyone who has this wholehearted trust and commitment to Jesus and has believed that He is Messiah, that He is the Christ, has become a child of God by the new birth. I want you to go with me back to chapter 3 and verse 9. He touched on this then. 
1 John chapter 3, verse 9. He says this, Those who have been born into God's family do not make a practice of sinning because God's life is in them. So they can't keep on sinning because they are children of God. They become new creations, so there needs to be a transformation that's occurred. So what does he say? Those who have been born into God's family. Also, he says in chapter 4 and verse 7, that theme again, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, agape, right? And agapao, there's a verb form of it. For love comes from God, and anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. So it's talking about that relationship with God as a child of God. You become a child of God. And then back in chapter 2, we're kind of going backwards a little bit, but look at John, 1 John 2 and verse 22, because this is very powerful. That's why I saved it for the last verse in this section. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 22. And who is a liar? Anyone who says that Jesus is not the Christ, that He's not the Messiah. Anyone who denies the Father and the Son is an antichrist. And He talks about the spirit of antichrist. Antichristos means in opposition to, but also instead of those that John was dealing with. Remember, we've looked at the defense of the faith in the New Testament, how God used John to defend the reality of the truth of God's Word against Gnosticism and that lie that was Gnosticism. And Gnosticism taught that there's no way that God would come and take upon a body of flesh because everything physical is evil according to that Greek philosophy. And there were people who had embraced that. Well, Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. He had to come and become a real person in order to live this life in our place, right? To die in our place on the cross. So they would deny that. And he said, anybody that denies the reality of who Jesus is, not only that he's God in the flesh, but the reality of who the Bible communicates that he is, that he is God, that there is only one true living God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, make up the triunity of the Godhead. You know what? And that's what God's Word teaches very clearly. If you deny that, if you believe that Jesus is a God among gods, that there are multiple gods, you don't believe in the triunity of the Godhead, you've got the wrong God, and it's the spirit of Antichrist, ultimately, that's inspired a person to believe that. And here's the reality, unfortunately. It's deception from the enemy. There are a lot of thoughtful, wonderful, sincere people who believe false things about Jesus because they've been deceived, right? So we trust God's Word, and we know the evidence is so we can trust His Word. And that's what he says here, that anybody denies that Jesus is the Messiah, God in the flesh, who the Bible says He is, has a spirit of Antichrist. And that spirit has been at work in the world, right, for a long, long time. But we know the world is being set up for one who will embody what the spirit of Antichrist is, and he will be the son of perdition, that world leader that comes during the tribulation period. So he's talking about that spirit being alive and well. And I want to take you back as we, again, we looked at that, verse 1 or in chapter 5. Again, everyone who believes that Jesus is a Christ has become a child of God. Let's go to the Gospel of John. I really felt compelled that we should spend a little time here in chapter 1. And let the Word speak to your heart about this reality. And you know what? If, if there's anybody here today, and a God alone knows our hearts, I know a lot of you guys, and I know that you're born again. I know that you become children of God. But God alone knows the hearts of the people here. And if there's somebody that God is revealing to you that you are not born again, that just because you go to a church or here today, that doesn't get you into heaven. You have to be born again. And so we find this, and I want to, Share what John said, again, in this final writing that the Holy Spirit inspired through him. In John 1.1, 1, 1, it says, In the beginning, the Word already existed, the Logos. The Word was with God, that's with the Father, and was God, not a God. He was God, and He is God, right? It's talking about the eternality of Jesus and that dynamic of relationship with the Father within the triunity of the Godhead. When it says, in the beginning, in verse 2, he existed in the beginning with God, that's not him having a beginning. It's when God created this universe, me created this planet and stretched out the heavens because God himself doesn't have a beginning or the end. Remember, his name Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahweh means self-existent one. He's always been. And again, I know that's, whew, that's above our pay grade, right? But he's the one who spoke eternity, or everything that is, get, exists, the entire universe, into existence. And he says he existed in the beginning with God. Look at verse 3. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. That dynamic again within the triunity of the Godhead 
working together, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in the creation. And so this should magnify and exalt and lift Jesus up for us this morning. Because when we talk about Him being Messiah, remember who He is, how awesome and majestic that reality is. Verse 4 says, The Word, the Logos, gave life to everything that was created. Keep that in mind, life. To become a child of God, your spirit has to be given life. Until you accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, until you wholeheartedly trust in Him for salvation, believe who He is, guess what? You are dead spiritually. You're dead in your sin. And judgment is already upon you. You have to be rescued from that reality. So the Word, the Logos, gave life to everything that was created, and His life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. Verse 6 says, God sent a man, John the Baptist, not John the Apostle, but John the Baptist, to tell about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. As believers, guess what? We're supposed to be able to give a witness to the reality of who Jesus is, that we believe Him, we trust Him, and that we're willing to testify on His behalf, right? And that's one of the central focuses that we see in 1 John 5, and we'll see that when we get back there. But he's talking about John being this unique witness. Verse 8 says, John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. So Jesus, who created the world, was now coming into the world, and He came in His humanity. And look what it says in verse 10. He came into the very world that He created. Isn't that, doesn't that blow your mind? The very world that He created, He then humbled Himself, became a human, fully God, fully man, Emmanuel, God with us. And he stepped into his own creation. But the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people. That would be the Jewish people. And even they rejected him. Messiah they had long awaited for. Now here's the key. Verse 12. But to all who believed him. Remember what we saw in verse 1 of 1 John 5? That they who believe that Jesus Christ is Messiah, right? become part of his family or children. So what does he say? But to all who believe, have entered into a vital, continuous, wholehearted trust in him, Jesus, have what? And have accepted him. He gave the right, exousia, the power, the authority to become children of God. You have to become a child of God. Remember that misnomer we've talked about before? How many people, I've even heard, maybe even well-intentioned pastors say, well, all humanity, we're all children of God. No, we're not. We're all created. God created humanity. We're all part of the human family. But you have to become a child of God spiritually, meaning you must be born again. That's what he's saying. You become a child of God. And how does that happen? Verse 13. They are reborn. That means born again. Not with a physical birth. That's happened. If you're sitting here today, you've had the physical birth. But not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. That's a spiritual birth, being born again, right? So he talks about that. And how was that accomplished? Verse 14, because the Word became human, the Logos, and He made His home among us. Jesus tabernacled among us, and He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, grace and truth. And we have seen His glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. How powerful is that? So let's go back to 1 John. 1 John again, chapter 5, verse 1, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ, right? We just saw that you must believe that He is Messiah. You can become a child of God. And He's saying, look, if you believe in Jesus, you become a child of God. And here's the reality. Because you love God, everyone who loves the Father loves His children too. And He talked a lot about that, that we're supposed to love each other as Christians, right? And there are times we probably feel like, well, I I don't like them, (laughs) but I love them, Jesus, (laughs) right? Even in your own family, right? My wife would probably tell you there's times she doesn't like me, (laughs) but she loves me, don't you? (laughs) Oh, she's shaking her head this way. Now you're going to go like this. (laughs) We all know that dynamic, right? And again, the body of Christ is a family. But we're supposed to love each other. And he says that's an evidence of the agape love, the selfish and sacrificial love abiding in in his hearts of his people. Now look at verse 2. He says, look, we know we love God's children, have that agape for each other, How do we know that? If we love God and obey His commandments. So that can seem overwhelming, but look what verse 3 says. Loving God means keeping His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. We've talked about the fact that there are 613 commandments in the Old Testament. 
There's a top ten. It's called the Ten Commandments, right? You look at those Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, the first four are about relationship with God. The second half of those, the six, six after that, making up the ten, are about relationships with people. So that God is all about relationship, that we would know Him and love Him, that we have no other gods before us, that we would worship Him wholeheartedly and be obedient, and then that we would love those around us. If we love those around us, we're not going to be hurting them. We're not going to be sinning against them. And here's this amazing reality in Matthew 22. And we've gone here before, but it's worth hitting again because we want to see how God clarifies. And here's the reality when it says back in what we've just read that keeping His commandments are not burdensome, if God said, look, you've got to keep all 613 commandments, I don't know about you, but I'd say, can't do it. In fact, Lord, I look at the top 10, and you know, if all of us are honest, we would say, in fact, I've broken half of those, right? So how in the world is it not burdensome to keep God's commandments? Because it's not about that. It's about love. And if we love God with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength, we seek Him through His Holy Spirit. He empowers and he compels us to love him and then to love those around us and the religious leaders came to jesus and this is what they said in matthew 22 and verse 37 a scribe asked jesus what the greatest and most important commandment was of the law of moses jesus replied verse 37 matthew 22 you must love the lord your god yahweh your elohim with all your heart all your soul and all your mind basically with all that you are this is the first and the greatest commandment. We would all say, amen, and how, right? I get it. That makes sense. But look what he says in verse 2, or verse 39, the second point. And a second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. Not just the people who live in houses next to you in your neighborhood, but just people in general, right, that you share life with in your community. But love your neighbor as yourself. Look at verse 40. How powerful is this? The entire law. And all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Again, if we're loving God first, then by the power of the Holy Spirit, He compels us to love those around us. And if we love those around us, we're not going to be committing adultery. We're not going to be hating them. We're not going to be stealing from them. We're not going to be coveting what they have or being jealous of them. We're going to want what's best for those around us because we're selfless and we're sacrificial. Amen? So Jesus says it's not burdensome. He says that to John, and the only way it's not burdensome, again, is if Jesus is on the throne of our hearts. And here's an interesting thing that uh, we know that in one of the other Gospels, it talks about the fact that, that one of the scribes says, yes, I understand that loving you, loving God first and foremost, he didn't say loving Jesus because he didn't believe Jesus was Messiah. But there was something going on in his heart because as he heard Jesus he expressed the reality, yes, I know that loving God and loving people is more important than even sacrifices that we would bring to you under the law. And Jesus said, you are not far from the kingdom of heaven because he was getting it. He was understanding it was about relationship and about loving God and the importance of all. He said that in Mark 12, verses 32 through 35. Go with me to Galatians chapter 5. We're looking at this reality of love and the importance of it. And it's a big deal to God. It should be a big deal to us. In Galatians chapter 5, and by the way, in the book of Galatians, as you're turning there, Paul was used by God to confront the Judaizers. They were promoting false teachings, saying that yes, you believe in Jesus, but you must obey the law too. That's part of the deal. And Jesus just summed up what we're supposed to do in terms of obeying the law. Love Him, love people. And like it says in Galatians 5.1, so Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. Now go to verse 13. As he works his way through this about what it is to have freedom in Christ and not under the law, look what he says in verse 13. For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Don't be self-centered and selfish, he's saying. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. Look at verse 14. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's Paul. What did Jesus just say? You love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Second, love your neighbor. Paul said, hey, check this out. It's all summed up in this, love your neighbor. Because Paul said that because he knew the only way you could love your neighbor is if you are loving God, first and foremost, Right? And here's what God produces at the end of that chapter by the Holy Spirit, verses 22 and 23. If we're committing our hearts to God as believers and we're trusting Him and we're a work in progress, God knows that. 
But he says the Holy Spirit can produce this in us. Verse 22, but the Holy Spirit, not you, not me, right? I can't do this. You can't do this. But the Holy Spirit can produce this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, agape. That's first. It's foundational. Then joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Why? Because you're not violating anything. You're walking and living in truth. Isn't that amazing? And so those are like building blocks. And you know what? Uh, you know what's special? Sometimes you come across or you meet a believer who has such depth of relationship with God that you see this fruit. You see an unconditional love and a joy and a peace. You see a, a patience in them that just blows you away. You see goodness and faithfulness, gentleness, and even self-control that inspires you but makes you go, wow. And you glorify God because you know that's a person who loves the Lord. And you watch their life. And the only reason that is manifested in their lives is because of God, right? Because of the Holy Spirit. That's what God wants to do. Can you imagine if we were committing our hearts to such a place that His love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control were, were predominantly at work in our lives? Man, wouldn't that be beautiful? The love we would share for each other as we love the Lord and as we love each other, it would be an amazing thing. So as we go back to what John was talking about, he was saying just that. The love means keeping His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. So again, if we love Him, we love people, the Holy Spirit compels us to live the right way. If we start to veer off track, you know what, when you're driving down the road, and you know what, there are laws in place. Why? Ultimately, for our safety, we have to have parameters. And if we could just drive everywhere like it's the Autobahn and there were no speed limits, you know, people would get run over. People would get killed because there are a lot of people would rather drive 90 than 35 some places, right? Admit it. Amen. <laughs> I've seen your car. I can understand why you'd want to go 90 <laughs> or more. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's there for safety's sake to protect. God has those parameters not to be a killjoy, but to protect us. And that our joy and our, what we want and desire is ultimately found in Him. So if we love Him, then we want to be obedient. Look what he says in verse 4, 1 John 5 now. For every child of God defeats this evil world, and we achieve this victory through faith. Here's the reality. When we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, He extended His victory over the enemy in hell and death and the grave to us. Look at verse 5. And who can win this battle against the world, this fallen system of the world? Only those who believe, who have entered into this vital and active, continuous trust in Jesus, right? Only those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You know what that also means? You believe that He is God the Son. How powerful is that? So it's then that we achieve this victory. I'm so glad that Rob shared those verses from Romans when he talked about those who faithfully serve our country and that story, that account of that young soldier who had given the full measure of service and devotion because he gave his life and it was in his Bible that it underlined those passages, right? And here's the reality. The Romans tells us that we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus as believers. That word more than conquerors, hupor nikeo, means that we have achieved a victory through Jesus that's above and beyond. Nike, we say Nike. Nike was the Greek goddess of victory. But it's just a Greek word. But Nike means victory. Hooper Nikeo means above and beyond victorious. That's what Jesus achieved for us on the cross over the enemy and over the world. And why don't we walk in that? Because we don't have depth of relationship with Jesus that we should. The deeper we go with the Lord, the more that is realized and manifested in our experience in our lives, folks. It's an amazing reality. And then we begin to understand that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Nothing. Nothing can because of His love for us. So again, all this is a reality because of what Jesus has done in us and for us, right, ultimately. If you've accepted Jesus, you have eternal life. It's not something to be striven for or to be gained because you do so much down the road. At the moment you're born again, you give and gain eternal life. It's yours. Now we have this journey and adventure until we enter into eternity. And God wants us to have that eternal perspective. But here's the reality. How can God's children defeat the evil world? Again, even knowing Jesus and being born again, we can let the world defeat us from day to day, can't we? We can choose to give in to sin or to do this or that or to compromise and to let the enemy have victories and let the world weigh in. 
we make a choice in all of that. And God wants us to wholeheartedly trust in the victory that He's given us so that we can walk with Him and glorify Him. Now, he talks about testimony. Look at this. We're halfway through this. He says in verse 6, And Jesus Christ was revealed as God's Son, and this is interesting, by His baptism in water and by shedding His blood on the cross. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who is truth, confirms it with His testimony. Again, this is testimony to the reality of who Jesus is and what He's done. And it says, and all three agree. So here's an amazing thing, and we're going to tie this all together. And when it says in verse 9, since we believe human testimony, surely we can believe the greater testimony that comes from God, and God has testified about His Son. So to the audience then that John was communicating to, they would have probably understood what God had shared through the writings of Moses in Leviticus. It says in Deuteronomy, it talks about the fact that where there are two or three witnesses who have eyewitnessed something, then that's credible. One person alone, you can't take that at face value. But if there have been two or three people who have witnessed something, then their testimony is credible. It should be, right? So he's saying, we take it at face value when two or three people or more say, yeah, we saw that. This is what happened. We say, okay, there are two or three witnesses. And so, okay, we got it. Even in a court case today, right? They look at evidence and they look at eyewitness testimony. He is saying this as it relates to the reality of who Jesus is in verse 6 again. Jesus was revealed as God's Son by His baptism in water. What does that mean? Remember when Jesus began His messianic ministry, it's when He went to the Jordan River. And John the Baptist, as we read in John chapter 1, saw Him coming. And He would say later on in John 1, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus came and said, you need to baptize me. And John is like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I'm not even worthy to unloose your sandal and take it from your feet. And back then, that meant a big deal. He goes, I'm not even worthy to get down on my knees and loose your sandals or even really clean your feet or any of that. And you want me to baptize you? Did Jesus ever sin? No. Was baptism for cleansing for salvation? No. Did Jesus need to be saved? No. He is salvation. He said, we do this because it fulfills all righteousness. And that's when his messianic ministry began. As he was immersed in obedience, when he came out of the water, the Holy Spirit descended upon him in the theophany in the form of a dove. And the Father said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. It was at that point his messianic ministry fully began. He was anointed at that point for his messianic ministry. And one of the things that John is fighting against is false teaching. Remember we talked about Gnosticism, but there was also a false teaching by some people that Jesus was not Messiah his whole life. His messianic ministry began at that point in earnest, but from the point he was born, right? Emmanuel, God with us. He's God, fully God, fully man. But there was false teaching that Messiah, the aspect of Messiah, came upon him, and that's when he became Messiah then. But before he was crucified, that the aspect of Messiah withdrew from him. Wrong! That's a lie. And John is refuting that false teaching from that day and age as well. He's saying that there is a testimony of the fact that Jesus is Messiah. And here's what this testimony is. Again, when he came out of the water, there was testimony by the Holy Spirit that settled on him. And through the water, through his baptism and obedience, it was the beginning of his messianic ministry and here's what would happen after three years of this messianic ministry he would ride into jerusalem on a donkey on the 10th of nisan the crowds would shout blessed is he who comes in the name of the lord remember there were well over a million people in jerusalem for the spring feasts they had come for those three spring feasts jesus rides in all the people are recognizing his messiah but remember four days later the majority turned and said crucify him and they did and they did. And when he went up to the cross, as he worked his way to Golgotha carrying the cross, remember he had been beaten so badly you couldn't even recognize he was a human. Crown of thorns on his head, his beard ripped out, his eyes swollen shut, his back ripped to shreds from where they scourged him. Blood everywhere, folks. Horrible. And then he hung on the cross, stripped, and blood pouring from his wounds. And when it says here, 
that Jesus was revealed as God's Son by His baptism in water and by the shedding of His blood on the cross. Those were witnesses. The beginning of His ministry, and guess what? The conclusion of His ministry when He shed His blood. Those were witnesses to the reality of who He was and why He came. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And the Holy Spirit, who is truth, confirms it with His testimony. So we have all three witnesses, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and all three agree. Because all three confirmed and witnessed to the fact He was Messiah, who came and lived and shed His blood and died for our sins. Amen? And on the third day, folks, He was raised from the dead, <laughs> victorious over hell, death, and the grave. And God Himself is the one who gave this testimony. So when He says in verse 9, we believe human testimony. And God has gave this personal witness to the reality of Jesus' and Messiahship. And if you don't believe it and you reject it, you reject God's own testimony through the Holy Spirit, through the water, and through the blood. And here's the reality in verse 10. And all who believe in the Son of God know in their hearts that you understand this true reality. Know in their hearts that this testimony is true. And those who don't believe this are actually calling God a liar. So anybody who denies what God has expressed in His Word about the reality of who Jesus is and what He's done for us, they're the liars. Let God be true and every man a liar, according to Romans. That's a fact, right? There's no contest. Anybody that denies the truth of God's Word is a liar because they don't believe what God has testified about His Son. And that's what happens. Isn't it a tragedy? The vast majority of the world chooses to reject what God's Word says about these realities. And it's on them. God gives people free will, choices to make. And the vast majority of people say, no thanks. Or I just find that hard to believe. Or, you know, I, I just believe Jesus was a good man. Maybe he was a prophet. Had wonderful teachings, but there's no way he was God. But you know what? You're wrong. And you make God a liar if you don't believe that. His very Word tells us that. We need to believe who Jesus is because He is what the Word of God says. Look at verse 11. And this is what God has testified. He has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. It doesn't say, and this life is in His Son and this church or this organization or this group of people. Nowhere else but in Jesus Christ alone. You don't have to go to Calvary Chapel or First Baptist Church or World Vision Assembly of God or VCC. It's about knowing Jesus Christ. You must be born again. Again, and this is what God has testified, that He has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Verse 12 sums it all up. Whoever has the Son has believed that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, that He died on the cross for His sins and the third day was raised from the dead. If you believe that and put your faith and trust in Him and ask for forgiveness of sins, have repented, remember that word means to have a change of mind, change of heart, change of direction. If you believed and you've expressed your faith in Jesus and asked for forgiveness, God honors that prayer of faith in that moment and you gain eternal life. I did it when I was nine years old. All of you who know Jesus, you can probably reflect back in that moment when you called on His name and asked for forgiveness of sin, asked Him to give you eternal life. And when you prayed a prayer of faith with a whole heart of trust in Jesus, guess what? In that moment, you were born again. Not because of emotion, but because of God's truth, and you believed it. And here's the reality, again, verse 12. Whoever has the Son has life. If you have Jesus this morning, if you believed Him as Lord and Savior, and you know that, and you've been born again, you have eternal life. And here's the reality, the last half of that verse. Whoever does not have God's Son does not have life. And here's the reality. If there's anybody here this morning, that you have not been born again, and God's showing that to you, you know that. If you were to die today, and I'm not trying to manipulate you, I'm telling you the truth, because God's Word is truth. If you do not accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if something were to happen today, later on, and you were killed in an accident, 80% of people have no idea when they're going to check out. It's usually through an accident, something like that. Heart attack, something happens pretty rapidly. It's a small percentage of people who have illnesses, diseases, or whatever, and they know their time of expiration physically is clubbing, right? But here's the reality. You could pull out onto that road this morning and be hit by a semi, T-bone, and be out of here like that. If you know Jesus, guess what? immediately to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord because of His grace and mercy. Amen? If you don't, you will be separated from God forever. There are no do-overs. There are no second chances. That's a lie from the enemy through religion in the world. We have ample opportunities, God's Word declares, 
in this lifetime, the grace that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Titus 2.11. And we make a choice to accept or to reject. And the ball is in people's courts. And again, this morning, if somebody here doesn't know the Lord, the ball is in your court. And as we go back into a time of worship and seeing God's face, here's the reality. You can pray right where you're at. You can say, Lord, you know, and you're speaking to my heart. And Jesus, I believe that your word is true. I believe that you are who you say you are, that you are God in the flesh. You died on the cross for my sins. You were raised from the dead. I ask you to forgive me. I repent. I want to have a change of mind, change of heart. And I want to walk in a direction that honors you and pleases you. I want to know that in the moment I draw my last breath, I'm going to step into eternity and be with you forever. If you believe that and pray, and we saw that, everyone who believes that Jesus is Christ becomes a child of God, then you can know with certainty that you have eternal life this morning. Or you can make a choice to reject it. And you're playing Russian roulette because you do not know. Only God knows, right? Our times are in His hands. We do not know when our end is going to come, the day or the hour, and we're going to step into eternity. It's going to happen for all of us. Benjamin Franklin said there are two things that are certain, death and taxes. <laughs> True that, right? Yeah, every person that's ever been born in human history, save one, Jesus Christ, is in their grave. God did some amazing things to Enoch. He caught him up and raptured him. There have been some unique situations. But even Lazarus, who Jesus raised up, his friend who had been dead for four days, guess what? He died again, <laughs> physically. That wasn't an eternal reality. There were others at Jesus' resurrection who were brought out of their graves. Guess what? Physically, they died again. Jesus himself died and was raised from the dead. And if we believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, then guess what? We're going to spend eternity with him. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, God, we thank you so much for your loving kindness, your faithfulness, and your grace, and your mercy. We thank you for your living word, God. We thank you for what it proclaims to us, the clarity that it gives us. Lord, we thank you that this thing that we have before us, this relationship with you is just that. It's not religion. The world is filled with religion, Lord, and do's and, and don'ts and demandments and commandments of men. Lord, your word says that we are to love you with all our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength. That's the first and most important commandment. And as a result of that, then you give us what we need to love people. And you also compel us to live for you. That's why your commandments are not burdensome. Lord, we want to honor you. We want to praise you. And as we just turn our attention back to just praising you because of you're worthy, again, Father, if there's anybody here this morning that you're speaking to their hearts and they need to call on your name, give them the courage to trust you. Give them the faith to believe in you and to call on your name. Lord, we surrender this time to you. Why we're worshiping, if there's anybody who's hurting and needs prayer, Lord, the elders will be available in the entry to pray for them. And Lord, just again, capture our hearts. May we have, may we give you our undivided attention, Lord, as we worship and seek you. And even now, Lord, we're going to quiet ourselves for a moment before we lift our voices. So just in the quietness with our eyes closed, Lord, speak to our hearts. And again, thank you for your word and your presence here in Jesus' name. season even of thanksgiving we should be thankful every day but lord we're compelled as we think about this and the reality of, of christmas being on the heels of thanksgiving lord it's just really the timing is irrelevant the reality is that you came you humbled yourself and took upon human flesh emmanuel god with us and so lord as we just think about that this morning as we sing your praises, God. And all we can do is truly worship you and to lift up your holy name, God. God, we 
again, church. Let's worship. Humbly to the earth you came, born into this world to save. God with us, Emmanuel. Now we adore your name, your name, your name. Strong and mighty tower, your name is a shelter like no other. Your name, let the nations sing it loud, cause nothing has the power to say but your name. Oh, Jesus, in your name we pray, God. Just come, have your way in our hearts, Lord. I always lift him up. Wonderful counselor, wonderful counselor, Prince of Peace. Your name is a strong and mighty tower. Your name. Shelter like no other, your name. Let the nation sing it out, cause nothing has the power to save your name. Your name is a strong and mighty tower. Your name is a shelter like no other. Let the nation sing it loud Cause nothing has the power to say Nothing has Cause nothing has the power to say Cause nothing has the power to say God with us, Emmanuel. Let's sing it, church. God with us, Emmanuel. Oh, God with us, Emmanuel. Oh, God with us, Emmanuel. Now we adore your
and hopeless compared to you, Lord. We thank you, God, that you want to have that personal relationship with us and, um, and speak to us and talk with us. Help us not to neglect that relationship, Jesus. Just to, um, just to listen to you and to hear you speak. worship you now this final song to speak the truth of who you are Jesus You speak to the sea, 
you stand in the fire beside me you roll like a lion you bled as a lamb you carry my healing in your hands God you walk on the waters you speak to the sea you stand in me. You roll like a lion. You led as a lamb. You carried my healing in your hand. Jesus, there is no one like you, Jesus. no one like you, Jesus, period. We praise you from the depths of our hearts. Again, thank you for today. Lord, empower us by your Holy Spirit. Fill us afresh every day. And Lord, empower us by your grace to be the people you want us to be. Give us a heart for you to spend time with you daily in your word and prayer. And just again, uh, give us courage. Give us strength. And thank you at this day, Lord, the opportunity we've had just to join our hearts before your throne of grace. And we look forward to the next opportunity, God, and uh, again, just direct us throughout this day and the rest of the week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. As he shines upon you, let him shine in and through and out of you. So that wherever you go, people will see Jesus, the light of the world. Next Sunday, a special uh, service, of course. We're going to wrap up First John 5. And then, of course, uh, we'll have communion as part of our Thanksgiving uh, celebration as well. So, oh, tomorrow night. Stars go dim in concert at Roosevelt Baptist Church, 6 o'clock. It's going to be fantastic. These guys are really, really good. $10 uh, at the door, and it's going to be wonderful. So I know we'll be there, so maybe we'll see you there. It's going to be great. Thank you.